Welcome to the Researching Practice, Introducing the Theory of Practice Architectures podcast. My name is Maureen Glenn, and I'm here with the originator of the Theory of Practice Architectures, Stephen Chemis. This is episode seven of this series of podcasts, and it is entitled Ecologies of Practices. So over to you, Stephen. So here we are, Maureen. <clears throat> In this session, we're going to talk about ecologies of practices. And um, uh, we, last time we we're talking about individual practices. I'll come back to that. And this time it's practices that are in relations of interdependence with one another. So last time <clears throat> we were talking about distributed practices, one practice, multiple participants. Practices that started the social, start of human coexistence. Distributed practices involve multiple participants like pedagogical practices, medical consultation practices, or the practice of football. And so in distributed practices, the practices of one participant may become practice architectures that shape the practices of other participants. But today, rather than one practice, multiple participants, we're going to talk about ecologies of practices with multiple practices that become independent. And I'll just tell you a little story about how the idea of ecologies of practices came about. Uh, I was working with uh, Rebecca Mutton on the practices of education for sustainability, which were relatively new practices and not entirely new, but uh, a, a kind of outgrowth of environmental education. And I'd done a project with many case studies of education for sustainability initiatives in the, around, nine to, uh, around 2010. And uh, they were reported in this, in this article in 2012. But <clears throat> one of the sites was um, a school where uh, teachers and students were rehabilitating degraded landscapes. Um, and the teacher and the students, together with people in the local community, were conducting these practices of education for sustainability. And some of the things they did in the course of that practice were collecting seed of, seeds of local indigenous plants on a nearby farm, taking that back to the school, germinating the seed, repotting the seedlings when they germinated, uh, and then putting them into larger pots. And then going out into local degraded landscapes in the community and planting those things and watering them in and so on. And one of the things they had to do in order to make those things possible was to build a shade house and greenhouse where they could do all the germination of the seeds and the repotting and preparing for planting and all of those kinds of things. And all of those four different kinds of practices were interdependent in the school's revegetation project, all mutually necessary for the project to accomplish its aims. Now, here are the people who are involved in this project. And remember, when you look at it through the eyes of the people, you're not necessarily seeing the practices, you're seeing the people. Top left corner there is John, he's the teacher. Farm Veg is a nearby um, uh, company that grows vegetables. The Reader's Digest is there because they're a sponsor. Neil is a local farmer on whose land the students collected seeds under his supervision. He had a, a license to collect indigenous seeds. Then the students from the school, conservation volunteers who worked on projects in that area. The school administration, of course, the Green Corps, which was then a, a kind of um, um, uh, many, for example, unemployed young people could work on Green Corps projects at that time. Then there's the community. Another high school was involved in this project. The Board of Studies of the State of New South Wales, which is the, overseeing the education. The school council, a local council greening group, um, greening the local town, and of course, parents of the students. So 
all of these people were involved in this project and parts of our uh, field notes and data, we had data about all of them. But in this next slide, here are the people who are involved in the seedlings part. John, the teacher, collecting some things from the farm veg place, the Reader's Digest sponsorship, Neil, the farmer, students, the conservation volunteers, student administration, Green Corner community. So all of the activities of growing the seedlings, germinating the seeds through to having the tube stock uh, and then planting the tube stock were carried out by these people. But as we were doing the project, we realized that the project depended on this shade house. And only some of those people have been involved in the shade house. John, the teacher, Reader's Digest funding, the students, school administration, allowing them to build the shade house greenhouse on the school grounds. But these two practices of doing these things, involving these different groups of people were mutually necessary, necessary for one another. So all of those things on the left, collecting the seed and propagating and so on, were dependent on the things on the right. And we could see that there were these relationships of interdependence where one practice depended on another practice. For example, having a shade house was necessary and maintaining it and developing it and all that for doing the work with the seeds. And so that became a very important part of our future theorizing um, of ecologies of practices. I, well, I'll press on. Is that all right with you? Yeah, no, that's really interesting. Um, I didn't see that. Uh... I suppose interlinking in the different ecologies of practices until until now, whereas I think that diagram makes it really clear. Yeah, thank you, Stephen. Yep, yeah. and you've got it, but you've got to think about it's the practices that are linking those people, not just the people themselves, yeah. onward and upward. So when practices are interdependent, if you're changing one, you might have to change others. So because they're linked in these ecologies, if you so if you want to change one. You might need to secure and sustain changes in others. So sometimes practices become entangled with other practices and become interdependent. Not always, just sometimes. And it's an empirical matter whether they do or don't. So it's a question for research to work out which practices actually depend on which other practices, because they could just coexist in the same practice landscape, but not actually have any uh, close interconnections or serious interconnections. So in pedagogical practices, the things, doings and teachings uh, relating to teachers' practices sometimes become practice architecture shaping the conduct of students. Now, these four, five kinds of practices here were at the center of our study, um, four-year study of um, changing Practices, Changing Education was the book that came out. We saw students practicing, teachers practicing, practices of teacher professional learning, practices of especially teacher research, reflection, evaluation, and practices of leading. And in the book, oh, let me first say this these five classes of practices, learning, practices, teaching, researching and reflecting, professional learning, leading practices. Since the mid 19th century, and especially since the rise of, of um, compulsory schooling, mass compulsory schooling, all of these things have coexisted. So, I mean, we've had learners learning from time immemorial teachers teaching nearly from time immemorial, but certainly uh, back to before the schools of ancient Greece and in ancient China. Uh, but with the rise of mass schooling, you have to have professional learning practices, initial training of teachers, and then the continuing professional education of teachers, 
because the state is now responsible for churning out those teachers to be in the state school. So professional uh, learning of practice comes in, but it, it comes in quite late, by the way. I mean, um, there have been a lot of people training teachers, of course, for a long time in the monitorial school system, for example, in the 18th and 19th centuries. But teacher education in the universities comes very late. It's really the 1890s in England and Scotland, uh, the 1890s. And why did it come about in that time? Because after the rise of mass compulsory schooling in the 1850s to 70s, people wanted to know what you should teach a teacher. And so university faculties of education or departments of education were established to work out what you should do to teach a teacher. And in England, they thought you should teach teachers philosophy and history of education. In Scotland, in the 1890s, they thought you should teach them the new sciences of psychology in, in particular, learning psychology. And so that division between those two perspectives on education and teacher education was crystallized in those two different teacher education programs and they're still alive in educational research and so on today. So up there on the right, the researching, reflecting and evaluating practices, they came in when, when, when um, in Britain, Her Majesty's, His Majesty's Inspectorate had to work out if everybody was doing their jobs properly. So you had to go about um, um, inspecting schools. And of course, our whole industry of educational research was also growing up. And then the question came up, what should you teach and how should leaders and administrators in schools behave? Because you've got all of these schools that you've got to fund and staff and so on. So you need to have a lot of machinery uh, of leadership to get these things happening. So since the middle of the 19th century, all of these things are common. And we call that the education complex of practices. Within, within each of these uh, practices in the complex, there are different kinds of species of teaching, different kinds of species of professional, professional learning, leading and so on. And so we were interested in how do they get connected up with one another and how do they become interdependent? Because when we were doing our big study, that came out in changing practices, changing education. We could see these links emerging. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Just a quick question there. Um, something that's causing me a little concern, uh, maybe with regard to the researching, reflecting, and evaluating practices loop, or maybe perhaps the professional learning practices. You know, is there a danger that these may not exist in the future in some jurisdictions? You know, as you know, in some places they seem to be walking blindfold into kind of scripted curricula and teacher proof curricula and where teachers are seen as mere content deliverers. What do you think? Well, I think there's um, even in even in jurisdictions where that's happening, that kind of um, um, weakening of professional learning practices. There's still the problem of initial education of teachers, and some of it, as we know, has become much less elaborate and much less substantial than it was 20 years ago, 30 years ago. And I would say very, very dangerously so, because a teacher that is shorn of an understanding of the history of education and an understanding of different philosophical views about education and so on, actually doesn't fully appreciate what they're doing in history. And when, when people began to study the sociology of education in a big way in the 1960s and 70s, many things were revealed about difference and the reproduction of social class and gender and so on through schools. And so those studies, very, very important for illuminating teachers about how their work is shaping uh, kids and societies beyond their uh, local perspectives and so although that's becoming 
weakened, it's still there. But there is also no doubt that teachers cannot help organising their own professional development. And teachers are generally really interested in their own professional development. I mean, there may be some who just turn up to work and, and go home at the end of the day and teach the same way for 30 years in a row and, and don't want to learn from their teaching. But it seems to me that I've never, I have not met many such teachers. Uh, most teachers have a great interest in their own development, including through action research projects, researching and reflecting on and evaluating their own practices. And of course, leading has become even more important than ever before. And the whole machinery of leadership has become so top heavy that um, it, um, it threatens to extinguish the, the sort of life of education in my view. So I think that, that these, these different practices rise, ebb and flow in, in history, but I, I, I don't think that they will go entirely extinct. Perhaps they will, but there are certainly many more ways of doing professional learning than, than there used to be when you take into account you know, the internet and stuff like that. Okay, great. Thanks, Stephen. So just like in food chains and food webs, different creatures are interrelated, in this case, in predator-prey relations. Uh, I don't usually describe the relations between teachers and students as predator-prey relations, but <laughs> perhaps you could. <laughs> so that star grass down the bottom feeds those different animals in the middle, the primary consumers, and they become the meals for the ones up the top, uh, up the top there. And so each of these practices is interdependent. They're dependent on one another. And I think the same is true of practices. And as I've said, I think practices are a bit like species and they have these interrelationships. So here's that education complex of fact practices. Now, in the substantive practices, chapters of this book, Changing Practices, Changing Education, where we we're looking at a, a few different Australian schools in a couple of states, we we're looking at what goes on in each of these practices in each of the schools and what the relationships were between them. So, one chapter in the in the book is about learning, uh, for example, but at the end of the learning chapter, there's an ecologies of practices section that says, here's how learning, how we saw learning in the empirical data relating to teaching, professional learning, research reflecting evaluation and leading practices. And so when, for every chapter, there are the other four at the end of the chapter the other four are uh, explored in relation to that one and so you could get a very strong sense of these relationships and some of them some of them of course were um, very powerfully related and some not so powerfully related so here's here's one example at uh, hillview primary school uh, there was a great interest in student practices at inquiry how do students come to do that inquiry? Teachers use practices of inquiry teaching to instill practices of inquiry in students. And the teachers develop their inquiry teaching by researching their own practice and working together and exchanging views and action research groups and, and collaborative professional learning deliberately designed so that they would develop their collaborative research uh, practices, in, in this case, into inquiry, teaching and learning. But why were they doing that? Because the executive of the school were very interested in inquiry approaches and they wanted to have inquiry learning going on in the classrooms, but they thought the best way to get that happening was to get the teachers doing research together on their own that they were going to do it through professional learning 
but the teachers did research together into their own teaching and would all see in the different ways in their different classrooms how inquiry teaching you know, how inquiry by students was getting established so that's an example of one little web of connections around inquiry uh, student inquiry at hillview primary school can i ask stephen if if i were a student um, if I was researching the practice in that school, either my own practice along with others or the practice that was happening in the school, how would you set about establishing what the different ecologies were? Well, I'd, I'd, I'd first of all just think about the education complex. There are probably different kinds of things going on under these headings. And, you know, we would when we went into a school, we'd think of it with a table with um, here are all the practices along the top that people are doing and here are the other practices down the side. When do we see teaching affecting learning? And when do we see learning affecting teaching? And when do we see learning of, of teacher, teachers teaching practices being affected by professional learning? And when do you see professional learning being affected by teachers teaching. And so just by going through that matrix, you could look for connections and, you know, you didn't know what you'd find, but you'd think about all the transcript data we had and the observations we did. And often there were four of us going to a classroom together and recording and, and watching and making notes and We'd come away and wow, how did that happen? And what was going on there? And why was that happening? And you're constantly drilling down, especially through history, to see how did this come to be? And you could ask the teachers afterwards, how come you're doing that? You know, and debrief. We used to have wonderful debriefing conversations with the students. You know, I remember we just had wonderful conversations with the students. Uh, we were having a conversation with well, about eight year five students after a lesson and we're sitting around the table together these eight students and we're asking them what was going on in the class and what was happening and what did they see happening and all that kind of thing and one of the students says um what do you reckon bobby and bobby'd say oh i think this and that and this and the other and then the conversation would go on and Bobby, a rather reticent, quiet student, wouldn't speak. And then that same kid would say, uh, what do you think, Bobby? And Bobby would speak and say, give his point of view. And, and so it would go three or four or five times in this one hour session. Easy to talk to the kids for an hour about a lesson. Amazing. That, they are so expert on what goes on in in classrooms. It's just lovely to talk to them, I think. Of course. Anyway, but when we saw this wonderful conversation, this uh, why is Jimmy asking Bobby to come in? Light bulb. The whole school is committed to inclusion. And the whole school practices inclusion and, and teachers are trying to practice inclusion every day in the classrooms and the students are learning it. And the students are taking these active steps to include the kids. So when the, kid, when the school says it's part of our school mission to be inclusive, you can see that the teachers have been practicing teaching it, the students, have, and, and they've been getting the students to practice it. And we thought, this is just a wonderful expression of a deep commitment of the school to values of inclusion being expressed in everyday practice with Jimmy and, and reticent Bobby. And Bobby just chiming in and saying his bit. It was, for me, it was just an incredibly beautiful thing. Yes, and we can all learn from it, really, can't we? Yes, but I think the, 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 the thing is trying to be sensitised ourselves to look for 
so where did this teacher's teaching come from? Why are they doing it this way? Where did, where did your own teaching come from? Why are you doing it this way? Uh, and so on. And, and trying to see how, how things are changing. And if you introduce an action research project into the school and you start exploring your own practice, how do you see your own practice as being shaped by it? professional learning, your own professional learning in the project, other people's professional learning around you, the way you're supported or not supported by the, the people who are doing the leading in the school. And of course, you are doing some of the leading in the school, just as the learners at the top of the picture are doing a lot of leading themselves uh, in the school. Just go to go back to say the say if somebody who's starting on a research project and wanting to utilize um practice architecture is to help them and they're at the stage that they're looking at ecologies of practices and i'm just wondering you know are they so you came in with a kind of a list in your head uh in this particular instance uh i'm just wondering does that list grow or you know does it broaden out in the process of the research or is it something you establish at the beginning and stay with, would you say? It's, it's, a, it's an interesting question in this way for me. When, when we eventually came to describe this education complex, I was very, very committed to the idea that these five kinds of things go on in, in schooling everywhere around the world. But they're done differently everywhere around the world. Now, you could say, don't we need to have school maintenance and uh, uh, pro project uh, practices there or, you know, school architecture practices or whatever? I mean, you could say, yes, there are a whole lot of other practices that can be equally um, linked. But the key thing is to say, in this practice that we're observing, my own, other people's, what are the actual links between these practices? It's it, it's not it's not. Of course, of course, professional learning shapes teaching, but when you look at this teaching that's going on in front of you now, this particular teaching, where did the sayings of the, that teaching come from? Where did the doings of that teaching come from? Where did the relatings of that teaching come from? because everything has a history. And when you explore the history, you discover all these wonderful things. In that, in that project, we discovered a school district that had a 20 year program of change, bring in, introducing communities of practice or communities of professional learning. And they were extraordinarily committed to it. And they'd had, Communities of Practice Institutes for 20 years. All of the principals had been through them. All the senior teachers had been through them. Younger teachers were beginning to go through them. And, but at every site, people were trying to, to, trying to demonstrate the power of collaborative practice and collegial uh, practice together. And we were very, very impressed by the depth of this uh, commitment, but also in the face of new brooms sweeping clean, new new directors or whatever coming in, somehow or other, this commitment survived for 20 years, despite other fads coming in on top of it and, and so on. But you could see that it was living in the, in the practice of the school, right down to the level of the kids. So I thought, I thought it was, it tells you something about the history, not just of this school, but of this whole school district and its connections. And of course, they had all these consultants and who came in from universities and, you know, private companies around the place to help them to do this. So they invested a huge amount of money and time and effort in bringing these things about. And it comes out in, what do you reckon, Bobby? <laughs> I mean, it's just to me very beautiful. Yes, it's a fabulous example, lovely example. Yeah. Well, 
So back to the point from earlier on, when practices are interdependent, securing a change in one may require securing and, and sustaining changes in other practices as well. And I think the, the, the little case study that we've just talked about demonstrates that kind of thing. So that's ecologies of practices, Maureen. Phyllis. And that's been so interesting, Stephen. Thank you so much. Really great. Well, thank you, Stephen, for helping us understand how we might use the theory of practice architectures to understand ecologies of practice. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us for Episode 7 of Researching Practice, introducing the Theory of Practice Architectures vodcast with Stephen Kenneths and me, Maureen Glenn. The next episode is Episode 8 and is entitled Changing Practices. You may access these vodcasts via YouTube or at stephenchemist.com or at eaori.ie. Looking forward to seeing you the next time. So it's bye from me. And bye from me.